I just feel like, I mean, yeah, we had trials in our life, but I, I did live a very, very blessed life. I still do, but this experience has opened my eyes to the suffering and the grief that is all around us. Yeah. And hopefully I have become a more compassionate person that will show up to help those other people that are going through hard things the way that people showed up for me. Yeah. Welcome to another episode of Relentlessly Resilient, where real people share real life experiences and the tools they've developed to move forward and live their best life. Presented by Minky Couture, the original Minky Couture blanket is to die for. They are amazing blankets, the softest, most luxurious blankets you can find. They have great customer service. They are made of the highest quality. Six Utah locations. You can find them across the state of Utah or online at minkycouture.com. My name's Michelle Scharf, and I'm your host today. My co-host, Jenny Taylor, was unable to make it. So I'm flying solo. Today I have a special guest with me. Her name is Holly Hall. She's been a listener to our podcast. And early on in her grief story, um, she reached out to me and wanted to share. And then we decided that maybe she needed a little bit more time, a little bit more distance. And I'm really honored that she wanted to come in and speak with us today. Holly is a wife of Garrett Hall, who I did not know personally, but I did know of him through my political dealings within the state for many years. And he was at the Department of Agriculture, right? Yes, at the time that of his death. Yeah. Before that, he worked for Utah Farm Bureau. Yeah. And he was the vice president. Or, um, at Utah Farm Bureau, he was over policy and policy. So he was, he was their uh-huh. lobbyist. Yeah, I knew that there was some. So he worked with my related family member, Sterling right. Brown. Yeah. yeah, yeah, which is how I kind of knew of him and, right. and and have crossed paths with him. So Holly, you have quite the story. I mean, your loss is kind of shocking, and it just happened really out of the blue. What would you like us to know about Garrett? about yourself, your family, and then let's get into that story. Okay. Just a little bit about us. We met, I was going to BYU and he was in Cache Valley. He'd just gotten back from his mission. He had worked for my aunt and uncle on their dairy farm before his mission. When he got back, then they wanted us to meet and we hit it off and dated for a while and then he says that he saved me from BYU and I transferred to Utah State when we got married in December of 1996. And then just three months after we got married, we bought some cows and started our own dairy farm. We rented his grandpa's old dairy farm, fixed it up and bought some cows and started that while we were both going to school at Utah State. (laughs) So... You know, I would tease him and say, you know, a lot of people just wait until they're done with school to start their career. And he said, why wait? Let's just get, let's get started. Let's, let's and get so started. he was ready to yeah. go. Yeah. So we did that um, for 16 years. We had our dairy farm. We raised our kids. We had six kids. And he was so good at just figuring things out. If, you know, something broke or a shed fell down, he would rebuild it. He figured out things so well and loved farming, Mm. especially because it allowed us to be, he was with us. He was with his kids and we. It's a hard life, but it's also a really good life. Yeah. We, yeah, looking back on it, it was hard. And I actually had grown up on a dairy farm and said that I would never marry a dairy farmer. (laughs) And then he waited till I was completely in love with him to tell me that his idea of starting a dairy farm of his own. (laughs) When I met him, he was a farm boy, but he didn't. He, was, he wasn't he had talking some, about it. Yeah, he had some beef cattle. I thought that the was a The funny lot thing easier. we say when we're young, I, I, <laughs> I kind of learned early on in my life to also not say never because right. my, my dad was in construction. I'm like, I will never marry someone in construction. I married a husband that that's all yeah. he wanted to do. Yeah, I've learned never say never for sure. But it was a good life 
it was a great way to raise our kids. They learned to work. And eventually it became financially evident that we needed to do something different. And we sold the cows, I think, in 20, 2012. And then he eventually got a job with Utah Farm Bureau at that time. We'd been really involved with Utah Farm Bureau as volunteers mm-hmm. when we were farming. And so we loved the organization and just. And there's some people that, I mean, I really do miss being up at the Capitol. In fact, I'm, I think I'm going to head up there today. But <laughs> when you start to really understand how policy really actually impacts your daily life, it, it kind of bites you yeah. in a way that you can't not be a part of it. You just have to to be a part and you want your voice to be heard. Yeah. And Garrick loved it. He loved being at the Capitol. He respected the lawmakers so much and the process. Yeah. So yeah. it was definitely a passion that he had that he eventually was able to spend quite a bit of time doing and helping the farmers and ranchers across the state. Yeah. So, so tell me what happened. So on... February 27th, 2023, he had had a cold through the weekend, Um, nothing too serious, but didn't feel real great, and he woke up on Monday morning, that morning, and got ready and went into the school. He was helping, he was a coach for our son's FFA parliamentary procedure team, and so He would go in from 7 to 8 on Mondays and Wednesdays to help with that. So he got up and was feeling well enough to go in and help with that. And then when that got done, he met me. I was taking my other son into the orthodontist. He was getting his braces off that morning. So he met me there and just said, we ought to get a doctor's appointment now while we're in this way. And he was concerned. He wanted to get feeling better because he had a trip planned for the end of the week to go to D.C. for work. And with two of my daughters, he was going to show them around D.C. So I called to get an appointment. There were no appointments available in Nephi. So they said we could go to Santa Quin. And we were driving to the, to the doctor's appointment. It was about a 15-minute drive. And we got about halfway there. And he just stopped breathing and, um, you know, his eyes rolled back in the back of his head and I didn't know what was going on, but I knew it was serious. I called 911. My first reaction was to drive a little faster, thinking I needed to get him to where he could get help. But the lady on the 911, she told me to stop and get him, get chest compressions going. So it was a snowy day. I pulled over as soon as it was safe and pulled him out and did chest compressions. Um, On the side of the road? Not just on the side of the road, on the interstate. We were on the interstate. Oh, my goodness. The cars were speeding by in the snow. Oh, terrifying. But, yeah, two women stopped to help me, which was so sweet. And... uh, one of them did the chest compressions, gave me a break until the ambulance got there. And then they did take him to the hospital and kept trying to get his heart going again for probably close to an hour. During that time, most of my family was able to get there. I have a son that lives in Kansas, so he wasn't there, but the rest of my kids were able to get to the hospital. And yeah, that's the day that changed our lives. And they just were not able to get his heart started. No, no. They just never could get him going again. Did they so. know what happened? I mean, do you know now? or um, just... The autopsy just said a heart attack. So we really don't know details on But he exactly didn't really how. have any health concerns in that way. No, no. He seemed to be a very healthy you know, just one of those things. Just, it just it just happened. Yeah. Yeah. It was a complete shock. I honestly believed he would live to be 100. He had, for two and a half years, he had a goal of walking 10,000 steps at least every day. And he never missed a day. From the day he set that goal, 
even the day before, the night before he died, he didn't feel great, but he still walked around the house and got his 10,000 steps. So, you know, he, (laughs) he was active that way, but. It's so hard for us when something like that that happens and there's not really a good reason. It just happened. Yeah. That's yeah. hard for the mind to accept. It was very traumatic and hard. I know I had never felt anything like that before. The So how many kids shot. did you have that were there and what, what were their ages? So we have six kids. Five of them were there. The oldest, 24, and the youngest, 13. Oh, wow. So. And then your oldest son that was in Kansas, how old is he? He is. He was 23 at the time. Oh, okay. Yeah. So not so your oldest. He got on the plane that day and was able to make it by the next morning to be with us. So. So what has it been like? Um. I think from that very moment, like at the hospital, we started having people show up to help us, which is a really amazing and wonderful thing in the midst of something so horrible to just see people show up to support and to help you in any way they can. We had people come to the hospital and then even when we got home from the hospital, um, my 16-year-old, um, his friends were waiting in the driveway for him mm. to come home and to be there to support him. And a lot of those were the kids that had just been with Garrick during that practice for yeah. FFA. But um, people just showed up. So many people showed up with food and, and just the most caring and loving ways that is definitely the the sweet spot of such a to feel sad so much thing. community and yeah. support when you've lost the biggest support of your life right. and the biggest love yeah. of your life yeah and online i mean farm bureau came out so many people started you know spreading the the, the word spread very quickly i found but um just so many people coming out with just wonderful words about Garrick and support for for me and my family. It was that part was sweet, yeah. and and helped us get through those first that first little bit at least. You know, for me, when when I lost my husband and we had his services, I think the most surprising thing for me were the stories that I was just not aware the impact that my husband had outside my home that of course why would I know like he he was out doing his own life you know and so many times when we're in that relationship and we're raising a family we think that we're kind of aware of things and this is our life right Mm -hmm. but I know that that was shocking to me and Garrick lived I mean, he touched a lot of lives in a lot of different ways through church service, working with those boys through the school. And then yeah, and he Farm was the Brewer. fire. He was the fire chief in our little town. Too. Yeah. Um, and yeah, because of Farm Bureau, he was able to touch a lot of people throughout the state. And it was neat to see. I mean, I've been very involved with him through his Farm Bureau work because I was already so involved as a volunteer when we were farming. So I know a lot of the Farm Bureau people, but yeah, I didn't know all the stories of the way he was able to help people all throughout the state. So that was really sweet to hear their yeah. their stories and their impressions of who he was. And it really is like solve to the wound of loss. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It was so, so sweet to me and to my kids. They even did at the Capitol. They had a moment of silence in the House and in the Senate. And that was just it meant so much to us that people would take time to to mourn his loss. Yeah. So, and to acknowledge, acknowledge his, his the goodness that yeah. he'd brought to their lives and to the state. So. Yeah. So we always ask everyone on our podcast, what does resiliency mean to you? I think that resiliency is just the process of continuing to try, to try new things and to be willing to try things that we don't think we can do. I know 
the day Garrick died, I had sent a few texts to some friends like, I don't know how I can possibly go on without him. And that's how I felt Mm -hmm. for quite a long time. And in the process of healing, I have found that, yes, I can go on. And there is hope of really good days. And we've had some really good days. And in the midst of the grief, you can still feel a lot of joy. Um, So I think resiliency is this willingness to continue on with a hope of better days and being able to enjoy the time I have left here on earth. I think that that was one of the biggest awarenesses I had is that you can actually feel great sorrow and joy and sometimes at the same moment. Yes. Uh, I didn't, you know, you think I'm angry, I'm happy, I'm joyful, I'm sad. You think that those are opposing and then you experience grief and you experience both joy and sorrow. And you're like, well, the, what is this? And, and it takes you a minute to realize I am so deeply sad and also so overjoyed. And it's not really something you can explain until you experience it in life. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. has this journey been for you you know it's been almost a year now yeah Yeah, we're coming up on a year coming up on a year I mean we spoke early on like within six weeks I think it was it was yeah it was pretty quick I I was looking for anything to help me to get through some of that intense grief that I was feeling that I never felt anything like before. Mm -hmm. So I remember I had listened to Jenny. She had come to a Farm Bureau convention and then I'd heard her on another podcast. And so I knew her story Mm -hmm. a little bit. And so I was searching for things from her. And that's when I found your podcast. And then I listened to a lot of your podcast during that first it and it really helped me I loved listening especially to the other widows that you had yeah um there were several things that just rang true to me and really helped me through that time and one of the things was one of the ladies said that she wished she wouldn't have waited so long to reach out to other widows and to Mm -hmm. like have that support from widows so right off the bat there were a lot of widows that reached out to me Mm -hmm. um a lot that I didn't know that had reached out to me and I got right back to them and and made time to meet with them. And that's helped me a lot to just have other widows for support because they can understand in a way that other people can't quite understand. Yeah. And we do all have very different stories, but there are some things that you can kind of put a clock to. Yeah. Like the widow's grief and, and the fog that you're in. And, you know, there's some really beautiful things and I was really open to having you on early but when we were talking and we were going to do it and then you decided no maybe I should wait a little bit but because I thought that it would be an interesting opportunity for other widows to kind of see this journey unfold in somebody's life you know but also I was really and we had this conversation I didn't want to impede in any way in your journey or your process, and I, I didn't want to maybe, like, exploit your grief, you know, mm-hmm. because it's such a, it's so personal, and it, and it is a personal journey that, we're, that we go through, but there are some basic things that do kind of happen that you can almost put a clock to, and there are some 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 things, depending on, on the relationship that people had with their spouses before they die, that are just, you're going to go through all of those first, mm-hmm. you know? And so I thought that it, it would be interesting, but I'm, I'm glad that you are ready to share today and that you have a little bit of perspective from those early moments to right. now. Yeah, I think it's good to know. And I had some widows that told me it does get better. And I was thankful for that. I also had some widows that told me it just gets harder. And I was like, how can it get any harder than this? Yeah. But 
in my perspective, it does get better. Um, not to say that there's not still really, really hard days mm-hmm. and that you still feel that intense grief, but it doesn't happen as often. And then probably the best or the thing that has helped me the most is the acceptance mm-hmm. of where we're at and this, I guess, acceptance of whatever feelings come to let those those be and then move forward yeah I listened pretty early on there was a speaker that came to my church and she'd been through she'd actually lost her two daughters and she talked about just how whenever she would have the thought that she couldn't do something she would just open her mind to say but what if I could And that's kind of how I've tried to live this year because there's been a lot of things where my first instinct is there's no way I could show up for that Mm -hmm. or do certain things. Yeah. But I've opened my mind to say, but what if I could? And I've been really happy to move through those things this year instead of waiting (laughs) There were some year. lucky things for me, I think, looking back. I had been a lobbyist, and I was over four states. So I traveled a lot alone, which meant I ate a lot of meals alone. And so I already had that experience of being in a public place alone, eating alone, and getting comfortable with it. When I first started traveling a lot, it wasn't very comfortable for me. I'd already made that bridge Mm -hmm. And so after my husband passed, you know, when I decided, like, I really want to go out tonight, I just took myself out. And I would read inside some other, like, Facebook widow groups of people that are like, I just want to be able to go have a meal with somebody or whatever. And I'm like, just go have the meal. Like, it's going to be awkward the first couple times, but eventually you'll just realize you can take a book, you can read the news on your phone, you can, there's a lot of ways to be present in that meal and enjoy it in a way that you can feel comfortable. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think. And it just takes some doing of it. For me, it was more the family situations, the family reunions, like especially his family reunion this summer. And I think I had higher expectations thinking it would be good to be there with his family, do the things that he loved. But it turned out to be really hard. But I'm glad we did that. It was hard for some of my kids, too. Mm -hmm. But I'm glad we did that because then it was easier. Like, the holidays with his family were even really good. Mm -hmm. And we went on a trip to Kansas to see our son in August, and we took Garrick's parents with us. And I was a little apprehensive knowing just kind of how that family reunion had been. But it turned out to be so wonderful, such a good experience. And... I just think if we hadn't at least done that family reunion and it was hard, Mm -hmm. we wouldn't have had the good things that came after that weren't as hard. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. All of those first, they're hard. Like my husband's family doesn't have family reunions, so I didn't Mm -hmm. have those experiences. Mm -hmm. But very interesting that, that that was hard, but then it also made the other experiences moving forward a little bit easier and it's an adjustment right yeah like it's just an adjustment and it's not really necessarily good or bad it's just hard because it's an adjustment and it's different yeah and it's not what you're accustomed to I I know for me whenever my entire family comes around even though it's just our kids and we're all together it's really apparent who's missing right Yes, and, those and so, times can be hard. And you don't always want to talk about the person that's missing. And and at the same time, you don't want to discount that they're missing. Yeah. And so it is just kind of an, an adjustment. I know the first couple family meals we had, my youngest son couldn't sit at the table and he would end up in the room crying. And like it was just overwhelming the emotions for him. Whereas some of my other kids are more shut down and they're just like, I'm going to get through this and it's going to be okay. And maybe they're not even shut down. I shouldn't even say that, but they just manage their emotions differently. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it's just, it's just a world of adjusting. Right. And I think with kids, it's interesting to see how each of them 
responds. Yeah. I've been really lucky because I feel like my kids have been really good at keeping him a part of our lives. And we talk about him a lot. We sometimes joke about what he would be doing or saying mm-hmm. in the different situations. But I feel like we've been able to, so far, keep him in our conversations and in our lives. And my kids have really helped do that yeah. so far. We'll see what happens in the future. But Yeah, it's hard. The, you, you know, and you're going to discover this on your journey and not to give you really any spoilers, but the therapist that I spoke to said that when teenagers to young adults lose their parent, sometimes the grief process can be a delay, mm-hmm. a three to five year delay. And so, of course, they're grieving early on, but it's not, it's just, it's much different once they get a little bit older and they get a little bit removed from it. And then there's like another, and I, I'm five years out and I'm seeing that. And yeah. I'm seeing the span of that time. Like I'm five and a half years out. So I've watched my kids from that three to five year process and, and they all just do it different. It's right. just different. Yeah. And I've heard that from other people too. Yeah. And I, I understand we're just getting started in yeah. this whole process. Yeah. And it's, but. you know, for me, I wanted to learn everything about grief and I kept thinking, well, if I learn all of this stuff, I'm just going to be able to get through it faster. <laughs> <laughs> and then my therapist was like, you've got to stop thinking that you're going to be able to figure this out, put it in a box, wrap it with a nice wrapping paper, put a beautiful bow on it and stick it on a shelf as if it's just something that happened. This person was a part of your life and he'll always be a part of your life because of your children and your grandchildren. And so you've got to figure out how to bring acceptance into that. So for me, I am dating and I've had different experiences in dating and it's challenging. It's challenging for a man to to be a part of your life and also hear about another man who was a great part of your life, you know, that is held with regard and respect, you know, and sometimes they also hear the not great regard and respect, right? Mm-hmm. The, because not a, your relationships aren't perfect all the time. So all of this becomes just a great opportunity of growth and learning and there's no real right way to do it. You know, I look back and I'm like, wow, I wish I could have done some things with a little bit more grace or a, a little bit more. I wish I just knew better or or I wish, you know. Yeah. But you just have just figuring it out as we go. Yeah. We just just keep trying. It's just like life. Right. Yeah. It's just like we keep learning and growing as as we grow in life and as individuals. And this is just another opportunity And it's a big one. It's a big one. It's a big one. It is a a huge, it forces growth, whether you really truly want it or not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right? Yeah, that's really true. So I know that you had written some words at his service. Yeah, I did want to touch on that because that was actually one of the things that kind of prompted me to want to reach out to you and share because Mm -hmm. I felt like this was something that was given to me, but not just for me to share with others and the people that I've shared it with have seemed to seem to help them too. Just a little background. We hiked my husband, Garrick, and my two youngest boys, Kaysen and Trevor. Kaysen was 13 at the time and Trevor was 16. It was on September 30th of 2022. We hiked the Grand Canyon rim to rim Um, It's about 25 miles, a lot of elevation gain. I can't remember how much it is, but it was a big deal for us to hike it. And it was like eight months before that I had decided I wanted to do that. I think I had seen some of my friends on Facebook or something had done it. And I was like, that would be a really cool thing to do. And at first I thought I would do it with some of my friends, but Things didn't work out with that. My friend that I thought I would do it with had some health issues and couldn't do it. So about the time school got out, that June of 2022, my son, Kaysen, so normally for the summer, 
he and Trevor would do a, get a lamb ready for fair and they would show a lamb at fair. And we wanted them to do that just to have something hard to do during the summer. We didn't have our farm anymore to teach them to work. So this is what they got to do. But Kaysen hated it so much. <laughs> and that year, I just had the thought, well, why does it have to be a lamb? Can't he choose his hard thing to do that summer? And so that year, I gave him the choice, and he said he wanted to hike the Grand Canyon with me, which I don't know that he really understood what that entailed at the time, but it worked out good. We would get up early every morning and walk or hike. We have a canyon not too far from us, and we'd go up the canyon and hike, and we'd just keep adding miles on. And a few weeks into it, I realized that this might not work for him. He was complaining a lot, getting tired, bored. And I was like, okay, how am I going to do this and not um, make it so I don't accomplish my goal in trying to help him to do it? So one day while I was hiking just with Garrett, because Kaysen said he was sick or something, I had the thought that we could listen to audiobooks while we hiked. And not just any audio book, but something about people that did hard things. And so we started with this book called The Undaunted. It's about the -the hole-in-the-rock pioneers that had to pretty much forge a trail down a rock. Anyway, it's quite a story about the pioneers. And anyway, it goes on. There's more series that go on to even into World War II and the, oh, wow. and the people in Germany. So he and I would listen to those books. We could only listen to them while we were hiking. And he, from that point on, he was all in. Oh, he wow. always, he would ask me, when, when are we going? How long are we going? Because he wanted to listen to his books. And it became just a really special experience for us to hike together and listen to those books about people that were going through hard life things. So that was kind of the backstory. And then it turned out Garrick wanted to hike with us too. He didn't always hike with us during the week, but we'd do longer hikes on the weekends. And when it came down to it in September, I felt like we were ready But I was also really scared (laughs) because with the Grand Canyon, you go down first and then you come up, Mm, you know. Yeah. So if you're not ready, you're not getting out. But that's where this came from. And then I can remember those few days after the hike. It turned out to be such a wonderful experience. I wasn't sure how to even put it in words, but I felt really strongly I needed to write something And so I finally was able to write something maybe that week after we hiked. And then the day of Garrick's funeral, I was going to be speaking, but I honestly didn't know what I was going to say. And that's when I was looking back at this post about the Grand Canyon. It really hit me and became kind of a a story that has helped me through this year. So I just wanted to read that, and then we can talk about that, yeah. if that's yeah. okay. Yeah. When I stood at the edge of the north rim of the Grand Canyon the night before our hike, I was scared. It just seemed so big. But we woke up the next morning and embarked on the journey anyway. We knew others had done it, and we knew we had trained, but was it enough? As we descended the trail in the dark with our headlamps, it was eerily comforting to look down the trail ahead of us and up the switchbacks behind us to see many more headlamps on this same trail. As the sun rose, the views became breathtaking. The scenery changed as we got further down inside the canyon. Every time it changed, I would think, now this is my favorite part. By the time we got 14 miles into Phantom Ranch, we were all feeling pretty good, but realized we had the hardest 10 miles ahead, and it was going to be hot. Those next five miles were a hot 100 plus degrees. We just kept putting one foot in front of the other. We took short breaks at the rest houses, four and a half miles, 
three miles and one and a half miles from the top. Then, with about three quarters of a mile left, my daughter Hannah met us with some ice cold water. That tasted so refreshing. We started going again, and at some point, I made the mistake of looking up. It seemed like the rim was still so far away. I took my focus off of how far we'd come and became discouraged with how far we still had to go. My other mistake was that I started feeling rushed, thinking I needed to make it to the top before dark so I wouldn't have to dig my headlamp out of my pack. At that moment, Garrick, in his calm and reassuring manner, asked Hannah to take my pack, and he got his headlamp out of his pack so I wouldn't feel so rushed to finish before dark. Kaysen gave me a reassuring hug, and we all started walking again. That made all the difference for me, and I was able to finish out that last half mile. My mom and Caitlin were cheering for us as we finished. My muscles were pounding by that point, but it felt good to have accomplished what we set out to do. With consistent preparation, hope, determination, teamwork, and support, we made it down, across, and up the other side, one step at a time. And then this next part is just what, kind of how I put it together at the funeral, how it compared. I imagine us in heaven looking down at this earthly experience and maybe feeling quite terrified. It just seems so hard, but we embark on the journey anyway. And as we grow up, we have different experiences, and some of them are just so good, breathtaking really. And with each life change or switchback, there is new scenery, and we think, this is my favorite part. Can we just stay here forever? But then we get to the next part, and we're glad we didn't stay in that other place, because this part is even better and more beautiful. Then we get to some really tough stretches, where it's hot and uphill, and water is running low, and all we can do is keep putting one foot in front of the other. And we have to stop and rest a little more often. And we do find comfort from the others, other people on the trail. But as we climb... The views of where we've been become better and better. We remember the good things and we're grateful for all the wonderful and beautiful experiences we've had together instead of looking up and seeing how much further we have to go. But when we do get overwhelmed with how far we have yet to go and we have our little breakdowns or big breakdowns even, there will be help. Our Savior will take our pack and give us a hug to get us back on our way when we are ready. Very often for me, my Savior is kind of like Garrick, sending earthly angels, quietly asking, can you go help carry Holly's pack today? And there have been so many earthly angels helping me carry my pack. I love that, Holly. I love the illustration that it is a mirror to our lives, our earthly lives here. It is interesting. I was actually thinking about this on the way down today, so Hmm. so it's kind of interesting that you read because I didn't know what you were going to read yeah we had not shared about that I was thinking today the big difference for us is that we don't actually know how long we get to go yeah and that sometimes is a beautiful thing um in your experience with losing Garrick it happened suddenly and he had no idea that the end of his life was coming on that day, you know, he was thinking, I want to feel good for the weekend when I'm going to have my girls with me on this trip, right? Yeah. He was looking forward to much more life. He had no concept that it was it was ending today. Right. And for me, losing a spouse through cancer, 22 months of knowing that this is coming to an end, but also learning during that time to live with him as if it's all coming to an end. It's not actually sustainable. Like if we actually knew our day, Mm. it's not sustainable to live that way. It would be very hard to stay that present and in the present moment all the time. There is an exhaustion about that. And so in some ways, it's also a gift to not be able to look forward and, and to actually know that end date. But other than that, all of the things that you wrote about the illustration between, you know, the preparation, the having 
somebody be able to have those encouragements, those uplifting words along the way, not only in grief, but just in our process in life in general. Right. That there's other people along the trail, not just those. I mean, for me at that time, I was thinking of all the widows that had reached out to me Mm -hmm. to tell me, like, you're going to be okay. I'm going to help you through this. But in life, just everyone that we're traveling along the trail trail with, that's what life's really all about. Right. But there is a lot of comfort in seeing people even on your trail, just knowing that they're getting through it. Yeah. Um, I had. A- it is the entire purpose for this podcast. It was those yeah. stories that were shared with me that I held in my heart of people that I met on campaigns that had just shared their grief and their loss with me. And I carried those stories and I thought they were so inspiring. Like it's so amazing that they can move forward and continue on and not give up hope and not surrender to their loss. You know, that's how I perceive those stories. Yeah. And then for me to be able to cling to that and say, I know this person and this person continued on. And that story is giving me hope today. And those stories literally carried me through. So we don't get through this life alone. And we really do matter. And sometimes we think it's the big things that we can do or the big service thing. And it's really not. It's even sharing the vulnerable, hard parts of our life. Being able to be honest and saying, yeah, life isn't perfect. And hard things happen. And this hard thing happened to me. And this hard thing's happening to you, but you're going to survive this. I promise you, there is going to be a brighter day. It's hard to believe it when you're in it. Yeah, yeah. And it's just so valuable to have people that you can see are getting through it. It helps you believe that you can too. Yeah. So I'm so thankful for the people ahead of me on the trail. And I love that you guys did this before and that he was a part of that experience oh, yeah. and it's... that he decided to do it with you because that's not really how it started at all. No, it's it's such a tender mercy for me just that we had that experience at that time with the four of us and my girls, two of my girls were there at the end to kind of experience that with us too. They drove the car around with my mom, but it's something that will carry us through. Like it's just this story, even just having this in writing for me Mm -hmm. is something that just makes me thankful to know. It was a moment that I knew that my heavenly father is very aware of me and my situation and that he's going to help me through. There's certain parts in there, like the part of, that there will be more favorite parts. Mm -hmm. And that was really hard to believe in those first, I mean, even right now, it's hard to believe that there will be more favorite parts in my life Mm -hmm. that could be any better than hiking the Grand Canyon with my two boys and my husband or many other things that we've done. But I can also look back in my life and think of times when I was just sure that it wasn't, you know, that it was so hard we weren't going to be able to, that it would never get any better better moving forward when we had to leave our farm Mm -hmm. that was so sad for us and looking back on it I can tell like just the amount of impact Garrick was able to have he wouldn't have had if we had just stayed on our beautiful little farm in Cove Utah Mm -hmm. um so I do believe there are more favorite parts to to come come. yeah yeah my favorite part in that and I what I thought was most profound was when you said that you were looking up to the rim and you lost sight sight of how far you had come that is deep yeah I mean that's happened to me so much this past year Mm -hmm. where I lose such track of how far we've even come in our grief Mm -hmm. because there's lots of times when it kind of feels like you're right back where you started yeah but when I can stay in that gratitude of just the life that we had, that's where, especially on this day, I was trying to say, like, don't lose sight of that when I start looking at how much life I have left to live without him, because that gets really hard. 
and discouraging. But when I stay in a place of, wow, we lived such a good life together and I had such a good husband for 26 years. And a lot of people don't even get that. Yeah, it's true. I've met so many people. You know, my reality, I don't know if this was yours or not. And are you dating at all? Are you? No. And you're not even no. interested. You've got young kids and all of that. So my reality was everybody's married because everyone I knew was married. Yeah. Oops. Right. Like I didn't yeah. have a lot of single friends. And I knew some people who were widows, but they were much older than me. So I didn't really have anyone in my circle of friends, my age range, that really were not coupled. And so when I became single for the first time since I was 17, yeah, <laughs> and I started having all of these, you know, new relationships with women and men and, and hearing about like their divorces or their losses or uh, my world opened up, I I join some single groups online and Facebook in Utah and there's thousands of people and hearing their stories have been like really eye opening to me and really actually gave me a greater respect and a greater reverence for the marriage I had for the relationship I had. No, it wasn't perfect. There isn't a perfect relationship out there, but it was really great and it was really good. And, and there was a lot of growth and, you know, there, there's a level of appreciation that I wish I could go to my husband and say, you were a really, really good man. And I honor you for that. Like I, I always respected him and I always told him I appreciate it almost every night before we went to bed. Mm-hmm. I would always say that. But when you start to see that there's so many other people who don't often really get to even have that experience ever, it gives you a real appreciation for having had it at all. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I have one quote that I've thought a lot about, too, from S. Michael Wilcox. But he said, my life had been so comfortable. Things I had once called trials seem so minimal now. Perhaps the graciousness of the life God had allotted me had separated me too much from the majority of my fellow men. I thought I could empathize with them, had empathized with them. Now I think... So this is what so many for so long have endured. And oh, that's beautiful. I just feel like, I mean, yeah, we had trials in our life, but I I did live a very, very blessed life. I still do. But this experience has opened my eyes to the suffering and the grief that is all around us. Yeah. And hopefully I have become a more compassionate compassionate person that will show up to help those other people that are going through hard things the way that people showed up for me yeah I know that I that that's one of my goals too like I'm I'm like people were so kind and so generous with our family and so loving and and also just the people that share their stories with me like you know for those listening who maybe haven't lost someone but maybe know of someone who's losing somebody talking about their person and letting them know about the relationship that you had with that person and maybe the lesson or the growth or the funny time or whatever it's so healing yes one of I know one of my kids favorite things and, and one of mine actually is is my husband had a really dear best friend and when he comes over for dinner and he'll laugh at my husband and tell the silly things mm-hmm. that he did or make fun of him or like the goofy situations that they got themselves into. It brings a realness to him. And it's, it's so needed. Like so many people only want to talk about the good things, but it's also great to, to talk about the silly things, the embarrassing things, the, the crazy things that were said or did, you know? Yeah. The kids love that. Right. Don't they? And I do too. Yeah. Cause it makes it's, them so much more real right. and, and they were here and they were imperfect and, and you miss those goofy, funny things yes. about them. Yes. I see. Like I miss everything about him. Even the things that drove me crazy when he was here. Like I just ache to have any of that back, you know? Yeah. And yeah, you miss it all. You do. For sure. You do. And there's there's just such a gift for anyone who's willing to share stories with 
those who are grieving. It's just, it's the best gift. It is truly mourning with those that are mourning the good and the silly. Yeah. And we didn't understand that until we mm-hmm. went through it, right? Yeah. But now we know that's one of the gifts people can do to help other people that are grieving is to share stories. That's probably one of the best things you can do. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I really appreciate you coming on today. And I, I know that you're a very faithful and active member of the church as well as Garrick was, and I'm sure you still are today. Your words and your testimony of your Savior and helping you get through those hard times are tender, and I honor you for those. And I'm so sorry that you had to be a part of this club that nobody (laughs) wants to be a part of. Yeah. I just attended a funeral on Saturday, and the man said to me, um, well, now I'm where, now I get to experience what you've been going through. And I thought for a minute, and I had a question on my face, like, I, I don't know what you're talking about. And he said, you know, being a widow. And it was the first time that, like, I didn't really identify mm. so quickly with it. Yeah. And I'm like, wow, there has been some healing and growth. Yeah, for sure. So I want to encourage good. you. Thank Th- you. This first year has been hard. <laughs> I've already had this conversation with you off air. Um, The second year, both Jenny and I found to be hard. The third year, I didn't find it to be great in so many ways. It's just different. And then something starts to really happen. And it's almost as if the grief isn't necessarily smaller because when it comes and it still does visit, it can be painful. And it's like it's all right there again. But those times are so far apart and they don't come with at first when it's going on, it seems like they come without warning. But as you move through this process, it seems like you can feel it coming on or you have some understanding of those dates that are going to be triggering and it just gets easier. It does. It, it's not time. Time doesn't heal anything. Because the wound is still there. You will always love this man. You will always grieve this man. But it gets easier to carry this part of you with you. Well, thank you. That helps. I always love to hear that it does get easier. (laughs) And I, I, I know some widows hate to hear that, but I have experienced that it's been a journey and it's not always easy, but it does get easier. Right. I appreciate you coming out here. You drove all the way to the studios for us. It's so great to finally meet you in person. And you're as beautiful and as tenderhearted and as deeply spiritual as I experienced you to be on the phone the first time we spoke. And I really honor you for coming on and and thank you for sharing your story with us. Thank you. And thank you for all your podcasts. They've helped me. A lot. I am so glad to hear it. It's it's a labor of love and passion for sure. Well, for those of you who have enjoyed what you've heard today, you can subscribe for free to the podcast on any platform where you listen to your podcast. And if you can, give us a rating and a review. It helps us be able to be found by other people listening. If you know somebody who has a story of challenges that they faced or you yourself have faced and you have found the resiliency in your story and you'd like to come and share and inspire others we'd love to have you on just click the little box on top of either our instagram page or our facebook page and you can set up a 15 minute pre-interview call for the podcast and i'd be glad to speak with you and and see if it's a fit for our show Thank you for listening, and remember, whatever you do today, remember to be kind. You have no idea the struggles others are dealing with in their lives. Have a great day.